John Mark, thanks for taking out the time to, to be here with us today. Uh, as a start, give us some background about yourself. Thank you, Johan. It's such a privilege to be here today. Um, I was born in Johannesburg, but I've lived all across South Africa. I'm married to Louise. Uh, we're going on to our 20th year and we have three beautiful children. I'm also a social scientist by training and I lead a, a development organization called MCSI that specializes in socioeconomic development. And we also lead various other development organizations and I'm also a pastor. Okay. So just uh, touching on that, so you're a pastor and you're also running a business. How, how, do you, how do you manage these things about being a pastor and, and also running a, a household and a business? Yeah, that's, that's the great conundrum answering that question. Uh, everybody asks if I'm able to balance all these balls, but I believe balancing is a misnomer. But to me, it settles it that since the day that Jesus saved me, it's one calling. Mm. He calls me to be a son of Christ, and he calls me to be a, a husband, he calls me to be a father, he calls me into the ministry, he calls me to lead a business and to be involved in development work across the country. So it's one calling, but cross-cutting into all these different areas. And it looks very different from week to week, month to mm. month. And it's being settled and at peace in that call. Because I think in the early years, I used to battle to juggle those balls. Mm. They became very weighty, almost crushing. Mm. Um, and I would feel guilty about underperforming in one area whilst I was giving to another area. But then I realized, no, God has called me to one calling, which transcends into all these areas. And John, uh, John Mark, growing up as a, as a boy, your relationship with your dad, give us some background about your relationship with your dad. Do you have a good relationship with him? Has it, has it been tough? Has it been good? Tell us about that. Well, as, as it is now, I'm very privileged. My father is still alive and actually he works with me in our business and development organization. We do socioeconomic development work across the country and him and my mom work with me. And in the early years, it, well, we had a very good relationship. We moved around a lot because I grew up in a pastor's family. My father was a pastor mm. and he would plant various churches across the country or he would be sent to get involved in the leadership of various churches. So we moved all over from Mossel Bay to Palabora to KwaZulu-Natal to Lesotho, we were very involved in missions work. But in those years, I had a very good relationship. I remember especially times that we would hike in the Drakensberg, times where we would go camping. It was a, a very special relationship for, for me as a boy and my father. And, and growing up in a household where your dad was a pastor and going on all these missions, was it easy for you? No, it wasn't easy because as soon as you would make friends, we would leave a dorpi or a town mm. to go to another town to get involved in missions work. So we were never able to settle in those years as a family. We were always upping and going. And it wasn't only locally across South Africa, but also internationally during the years of apartheid, uh, God called my mom and dad to go and spread the gospel in Italy and to get involved in ministry work there. And so we left South Africa and that was an incredibly difficult time. We lived there for two and a half years, uh, couldn't assimilate the culture, a foreign language, foreign people. And you also had the stigma of apartheid hanging over you. So it was a very difficult time. Even as a child, we'd face a lot of um, abuse from people over there because of what was happening back in South Africa. And having grown up as my mom's side of the family is Afrikaans, so all I knew was uh, barefoot and running around and playing rugby and climbing trees, and that wasn't quite the same culture over there. So we, we longed for South Africa, and after two and a half years, we, we actually came back because it was just a very difficult time. And, and how old were you then? I was 10. 10 years when, old when, when you we, moved back. When we moved back to South Africa. 
Okay, and then since then, uh, did you did you did you ever experience any any hurt in the church? Something that might have happened while you were planting all those different churches as a family? I was um, because I was still a boy. I was protected from a lot of that, but I realized over the years when my father began to speak to me that when he returned back from South Africa, people in the church labeled him a failure, saying that he had failed in his mission to the Lord in Italy. And they questioned why he had come back and they would not um, embrace his decision and understand that his family took so much uh, hurt and pain over there and that he had come back. So instead of that loving, embracing environment, he was um, condemned and judged for, for returning. And it left a lot of bitterness and hurt in his heart. Mm. And that, uh, that bitterness, um, what, what did that lead to? What, how did that end out? Did he stay in church? Um, did he stay a pastor? Or did he decide to leave ministry? Or what impact did that have on him? Yeah, and for, a, for a season, he continued in the ministry. Um, at the time, we, we relocated to Worcester, to the Worcester Assemblies of God Church. And we, we thereafter moved to Randburg, where he pastored a local church. But very soon, um, the bitterness got worse and the, the lack of support and love from fellow pastors uh, left him very alienated and very much alone to the point where he left the ministry and he then engaged in business. Okay. And, and this whole thing on, on your life, as a, so how old, how old were you when he left ministry, when you moved to Randburg? How old were you? I was, I was around 12, 12, 13 years old. Okay, so just in your, in your teenage years, this, this started? In my pre-teen yeah, years, that, yeah. that's when he left the ministry. And, and what, what impact did that have on you as a 12, 13-year-old? What was going through your mind at that stage? Just, about, just thinking on your own walk with the Lord, your own religion, your own experience yeah. with religion, um, what impact did that have on you? So growing up, Johan, um, I was always around Christianity and um, my father was very proactive in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, evangelizing and leading churches. But the ministry almost became his focus and his identity. And there's, there's a saying often pastors can leave their children behind. And although the word was shared with me, I never made a deep, real personal commitment to the Lord in those years because I'd grown up in ministry. I'd grown up in religious practice mm. and I almost became accustomed to it. So when my father decided to, to leave the ministry and to engage in business and I gradually began to see him move away from the Lord and fall away from the Lord, I began to question many things within the faith. Mm. Uh, I was about during my teenage years towards the end of high school and a lot of questions began to arise in my heart. So share, share with us some of those questions. What, what was the questions and what impact did it have on you? Did it change your lifestyle? Were you turning rebellious? What, what impact did it have on your life? At that stage, um, I wasn't rebellious. I was almost that uh, good boy. I was very preoccupied with sports and academics in high school and I would excel on the rugby field and the athletics track and academics. So I almost um, threw myself into those things there without giving what was happening too much attention. But yet in my heart I began to question uh, how could a man who was so passionate for, for God, for Jesus, suddenly begin to fall away from the faith and get involved in other things. And although I didn't know what was wrong, something was, I could sense something was very broken in this whole situation. Mm. And your, the years after school, when you, when you went to study, um, did you leave home or you were just studying home? No, I, I left home. So I, I graduated from Northcliffe High School and I went to the Rand Afrikaans University and I stayed in residence 
in Opirov. And okay. that's when my university or next season of my life began, really. Mm. Yeah, t tell us about that season, what, what happened during that season. So during that season, um, my dad's pain got worse. Uh, but at the same time, he started developing a very good business. His business was thriving. He franchised coffee shops and it was doing very well. Uh, but unfortunately, he fell away from God and became addicted to, to drugs. And that path set in motion a path of pain in our family. We, we lost everything mm. um, because the drug became an affair to him uh, because he was addicted. And I was at university at the time. I was in residence. And at that time, I began to deny God and say, where is God in all of this? And I became a very hurt and angered young man. And I was filled with hate for the situation and for what my father had done to our family, mm. uh, especially given the contrast of ministry. And now he had, he had hit rock bottom and was giving himself over to this, to this drug. Mm. Um, but the very real process of falling away from God had happened before my eyes and I began to resist and deny God. Mm. And at the same time, I began to then uh, get involved a lot with alcohol and with, with women. I was looking for a savior to save me and to numb the pain that was in my life. Mm. And so I lived for parting and alcohol and women. Um, I never touched drugs because of what had happened. Um, but at the same time, I did excel in my academics at, at Rao. Mm. Um, I worked three jobs to put myself through university, and I had a student loan, uh, which my mom helped me to get with APSA. Mm. And so through all of those, I remained committed to academics. But at the same time, I was very empty and hurt inside because of what had happened. And it continued to happen through my university years. Um, my, my father would be in and out of rehab um, and then he would relapse again and then he would go on these binging e escapades. We'd disappear for four or five days. We wouldn't know what had happened to him. And then he would appear again and there was just this, this hatred and animosity uh, between us. Hmm. And he would pawn off things like vehicles, furniture. I remember once having to go into Hillbrow as a university boy to go and retrieve my sister's vehicle mm. that he had pawned off for a debt. We would have Nigerians coming to our house, um, threatening us mm. because of the debts that he had rung up. So I was very broken. I was very lost, but I was looking for something to numb the pain and I was giving myself mm. to all these, these things that the world had to offer. Mm. So, so still during this time you had this drive to to succeed, to succeed in life and to make something of your life. Um, and then I remember in, in previous discussions we, we had, um, you mentioned that you became part of the, of the Freemasons as well for, for, for a period in your life. Yes, um, so I graduated from, from Rao with my postgraduate degrees in uh, development. I graduated as a social scientist and I then began working at a certain well-known internationally acclaimed environmental consultancy. And I started the socioeconomic sciences division. As a young individual, I was very brave. That's how I got my job. I was always very dedicated and focused and I couldn't find a job. So I approached one of the directors at this company and said, if you employ me, I will start a socioeconomic sciences division for you which I did, mm. and uh, it was very hard. I traveled through Africa. 
I swear, learned to swim in the deep end, but I learned so many life lessons in this field of socioeconomic development through that. But my state of lostness and pain continued and I gave myself to ambition and success, but the drinking continued and um, the, the woman continued. And I then met this director who became a father figure in my life because I was searching for a father mm. figure after the disappointment of my own father. And he was a Freemason and he introduced me into Freemasonry. And it sounded so attractive. It sounded as this community of brothers that would stand by you through thick and thin, given what my father went through through ministry and given what I went through with him. I was looking for that sense of belonging mm. to find camaraderie with brothers. And it almost the secrecy of it and the, the, um, the romance of it really lured me. And eventually I met with the Freemasons that he was a part of. And after, I would say, about six to eight months of trial and testing, because they first check you out, um, they invited me to join them, uh, which I accepted. And I went through an initiation ceremony. And that's how that journey began. Sure. And... Um... Going forward now, so we started off where you said you're currently a pastor and you, you've got a great relationship with the Lord. So where, where did your relationship with the Lord start again after, I mean, being growing up in, in the home that you grew up in? And then we've, we've had this period of, of drinking and women and ladies and money and, and worldly success and the Freemasons. And then somewhere, what changed in your life? Take us through that. What happened? Because surely you had to give up your, your rights or your membership of or whatever you call it, of being a, a Freemason. Um, take, take us through that. Well, during all my years as a Freemason, I got to the Master Mason level. Um, as lost as I was, and I was running away from God, I was rebelling against Him. Something in my conscience said that something is horribly wrong in this whole Freemasonry system and setup. Uh, it almost felt like the, the, the smell of death, as though you were part of something that was deathly and had no life. And so many people were deceived in that lie of what the Freemasonry is about. And I tried to, I wanted to leave, but I felt trapped and helpless. But at the same time, I was running a very successful division within that particular company where I was working with Freemasons, it was earning major revenue and I was flying through the ranks and I myself began to earn uh, major, major money within that, within that space. But yet I was very empty and the more empty I was, the more we would drink, the more we would um, uh, mess with women, the more we would start to go to strip clubs and were, the more we would live for the pleasures of life. Mm. Uh, even during work with, 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 with some of our directors, we'd work in the mining industry, we'd have early meetings, and then we would hit the pub at about 12 o'clock. And then we would drink till, till about midnight, even if we had to drive still 200 kilometers back to Johannesburg. Sure. So that was the, the life, Johan. And, <coughs> but the pain inside of me, it, 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 it continued and it got worse and worse. And during this time, my dad's days of drugging continued. Mm. And so I was very disillusioned. During this time at, uh, as a Freemason and working, I, I met my, my wife, Louise, whom I had met before in high school. She was a year below me in high school and was actually good friends with my sister who was in the same grade. Well, she was going to <laughs> Rivers Church at the time. And at this time, I was still running from God. But I, because I wanted to win her over, I went with her to church, but just to please her. Mm. And I also remember a funny story, Yuan. She was um, dating a number of guys at the same time, all Christians from the church. And I never forget going to a bride at her house 
Uh, she greeted me and disappeared for two hours. And then she came dressed as this princess and model. And the next thing, here's this oak coming up the driveway, hooting. And then she says, cheers, bye, I'm going on a date. And she leaves me <laughs> hanging there with her family. Mm. So I decided, no, I've got to rectify this situation. And one night after the worship service, I politely went to speak to some of these guys that she was interested in. And I used a very some very a few words that weren't churchy words let's just put it that way and i told them that she's mine from now on but she didn't have an impact in those years spiritually on me um the the honeymoon period was was quickly over and the, after you got married after we got married in january 2005 we had moved into a complex in uh, called Banbury Estate, and in the middle of this complex is a church, North Point City Church, uh, and I'm actually a pastor at that church now. However, in the story, we moved next to Christians who are part of the church, but I took a lot of the lies and the hurt and the brokenness from what had happened in my life into our marriage, and the Freemasonry meetings continued. I would get back in the early hours of the morning. The lying continued. I started lying to her about where I was. I'd be at strip clubs, but I would say that I'm at meetings with clients. Mm. The, the drinking continued. Um, and this whole broken situation continued. And because she had grown up in a broken home, um, she, had, she had sworn to herself that she would never uh, marry a man that would bring this sort of brokenness into her life. Mm. And after six months of, of marriage, um, I got to a point where, where I knew it was over and she wanted out because I'd hurt her so much through everything that I'd brought into, into this marriage. Um, so after six months? After six months. You're still married? We were still married. But, but no, no, you're still married now. We are married. Uh, uh, how long are you married for? In January next year, we'll be married for 20 years. So what, what did you do after six months? Were you still married after 20 years? Well, yeah, and that's where Christ stepped into my mess. What had actually happened is I had lied to her so much and hurt her so much. And our neighbors who stayed next to us were, they would share the good news of Jesus with me over the wall, but I would have none of it. I didn't want any of it. I was too busy partying and, and living my own life and living that life on my own terms. And one particular evening, I had a Freemasonry meeting. At your house? No, oh, uh, at the place where we used to meet. And she had, um, she, she had bust me a few times lying about going to places like strip clubs afterwards. And I promised I'd never do it again. And that particular night, I, I did it again. I was at a Freemasonry meeting and then we went partying afterwards. And I got back at about four or five o'clock in the morning, um, very drunk. And a very big fight ensued. Um, but she went to work and she came back in the afternoon and we continued to uh, to fight, it was like an absolute war zone, just the brokenness in her life, the brokenness in my life. And at that point, she said it was over. She was packing her bags and, and leaving me for, for good. And my wife, Louise, is, is a woman of moral integrity. Um, her yes is her yes and her no is her no. And that day, I knew in the depths of me that it was over, but I also knew in that moment, that Friday afternoon, that I had hit the, the absolute ashes of my life and that I was so lost and that I wanted to take my life. Okay. Our home was filled with brokenness and hurt and lying and really was that day was the culmination of all the past years uh, since being a teenage boy where I was disillusioned, where I was led astray, where I was broken and empty and searching for someone to save me. 
in the midst of, of that chaos, I realized that the one person that I loved with all my heart, my wife, how I'd betrayed her and hurt her and broken her, and she had packed her bags that day and she said she was leaving me for good mm. and she was not going to live a life with a man like this. Sure. But in the chaos, something supernatural happened. And it was like scales fell off my eyes in that moment. It was a Friday afternoon in July 2006. And for the first time, I could see the lie that I'd led and who I'd become and how much I needed somebody to save me. And being around my father in those years when you'd preach, I always remembered Romans 10, which he would preach about. And it said specifically that the word is near you and that the word is in your heart and that the word is in your mouth. And this is the message of faith, mm. that if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. And later on it says, and everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I also remembered the scripture in Romans 5, which spoke about how helpless we are, that whilst we were still ungodly, Jesus died for us. Mm. And God showed his love for us in this, that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for me. And in that moment, I, I for the first time realized that truth. And I called on Jesus to save me. And thank God my neighbors were there and they heard the, the massive fight that was going on and they came to see if everything was okay. And then they saw what was going on. So my neighbor's wife took my wife to the bedroom and then they took me to his place next door. And he called one or two of the leaders of North Point City Church that were there in the complex. And in his living room, um, I put my faith in Jesus, but it wasn't my own doing. It was literally, Johan, Jesus stepped into my mess, mm. to my sin, and into my brokenness, and he saved me, mm. and he gave me a new life, and a new purpose, and he redeemed me, and my life changed 180 degrees from that point in time. And was it easy when you made the decision? Easy to leave the alcohol, the Freemasonry, the ladies, the addictions, the stuff that you were busy with? I believe that, that God gives you the grace to say no to sin. And some of those things, the alcohol and those other things, I left instantaneously. What had transpired that night and that weekend is I knew that I had to leave the Freemasons instantaneously. And I burned my Freemasonry regalia in a fire on that very weekend. And I informed them on the Monday that I'm leaving for good. But they knew that I was going through marital issues. And they knew also I was a man for the party with, um, with a big propensity to try to do something the right way, but then I would come back to my, my old ways. Mm. Um, so they weren't really concerned. But after about a few months, they realized and they saw in my workplace that there was a major change. And then the atmosphere changed and we, my wife and I faced a lot of um, oppression from the Freemasons that I worked with. I recall going to work was like going through the gates of hell. I would close my door and literally weep the entire time in my office. Um, but in those years, God added us to a wonderful church, North Point City Church, mm. and he gave us new people that really cared for our lives and who stood with us in, those, in that very difficult time. Um, also, all my friends from school, my drinking buddies, 
who knew me as the, the big party animal, and that's who they loved, to be honest with you. They wanted that party animal, John Mark. They didn't like the, the new guy who professed to put Jesus first and who professed to put his wife first. Mm. They didn't want that guy. They wanted the, the, um, the party guy. And I lost all my friends except for one who respected the choice I made. Over that weekend, I informed all my friends after I was saved that Christ and my wife are first in my life from now on. Mm. And they didn't respect me, and I lost most of my friends. Well, I want to honor you for, for making that decision. Eh? That's, a, that's a big decision, and I know a lot of men struggle um, with that decision because they rather fear man instead of, of fearing God. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, John Mark, as a, as a closing, um, a man of God, what, if, if someone asks you, John Mark, what is a man of God, what, what would you answer them? Johan, um, I would say it is a weak, imperfect person like me, a sinner who has put their faith in Jesus Christ and who is trusting in Jesus every day on this walk of life as we follow God. Mm. It is a man who is reliant on the work of Christ, um, but living in weakness, but yet seeing the Lord do the supernatural through his broken vessel mm. that he is. Mm. And my journey over the past 19 years almost of, of my, my faith, it's greater what we've been saved into. And often the testimony is about what we were saved out of. But really life began at that point in my living room when Jesus saved me mm. and saved us into a beautiful church that loves the Lord. And out of this redemption story, our business was birthed in CZ which is running development programs across the country, mm. empowering communities with, uh, with development and bringing a change to, to areas. We formed other organizations that are bringing uh, humanitarian aid and welfare, sure. and our children were born, mm. and our, uh, we have two lovely daughters and a beautiful son, sure. and um, I'm still married, but I love her more. Than the oh. day I met her, it's not a perfect marriage, oh. but it's a real marriage, and we're still working through our things. And if there's any men out there, I think often they'd look at a pastor or someone that seems to be doing well in the faith, and they would then aspire to that. And I just want to say that I'm a weak man, but for the grace of God in my life. Oh. And without His grace, we are nothing. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes, but He's faithful. And he's faithful to his word and his purposes. And to any man out there, it's not too late to come back to the Lord, um, to, to, to recommit your life to him. Uh, but the Lord is in the business of redemption. Yeah. That is what yeah. Jesus did on the cross. And he rose again. Yeah. And he brings new life into broken situations, no matter how old you are. Uh, and the older we get, we, we, we struggle with regret. Yeah. Regret is a killer for men carrying those burdens, the baggages of the past. Well, Jesus takes that and he gives us a new slate, no matter your age, because that's the God we serve. Mm. He can do infinitely more, the impossible, if we would surrender our lives to him. Mm. Amen. John Mark, thank you, man. I appreciate your time and thanks for just sharing your heart and being honest with us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Sorry for the emotions. No, it's awesome, man. It uh, makes it real. Memories. <laughs> makes it real, man. That's about. That's what it's about.